When you think Monster Island, you think craggy rocks and bones scattered on the beach like the island of the sirens. The Cyclops' island was nothing like that. I mean, okay, it had a rope bridge across a chasm, which was not a good sign. You might as well put up a billboard that said, Something evil lives here. But except for that, the place looked like a Caribbean postcard. It had green fields and tropical fruit trees and white beaches. As we sailed toward the shore, Annabeth breathed in the sweet air. The fleece, she said. I nodded. I couldn't see the fleece yet, but I could feel its power. I could believe it would heal anything, even Talia's poisoned tree. If we take it away, will the island die? Annabeth shook her head. It'll fade. Go back to where it would be normally, whatever that is. I felt a little guilty about ruining this paradise, but I reminded myself we had no choice. Camp Half-Blood was in trouble. And Tyson... Tyson would still be with us if it wasn't for this quest. In the meadow at the base of the ravine, several dozen sheep were milling around. They looked peaceful enough, but they were huge, the size of hippos. Just past them was a path that led up to the hills. At the top of the path, near the edge of the canyon, was the massive oak tree I'd seen in my dreams. Something gold glittered in its branches. This is too easy, I said. We could just hike up there and take it? Annabeth's eyes narrowed. There's supposed to be a guardian, a dragon, or... That's when a deer emerged from the bushes. It trotted into the meadow, probably looking for grass to eat, when the sheep all bleated at once and rushed the animal. It happened so fast that the deer stumbled and was lost in a sea of wool and trampling hooves. Grass and tufts of fur flew into the air. A second later, the sheep all moved away, back to their regular peaceful wanderings. Where the deer had been was a pile of clean white bones. Annabeth and I exchanged looks. They're like piranhas, she said. Piranhas with wool, how are we? Percy! Annabeth gasped, grabbing my arm. Look! She pointed down the beach to just below the sheep meadow, where a small boat had been run aground. The other lifeboat from the CSS Birmingham. We decided that there was no way we could get past the man-eating sheep. Annabeth wanted to sneak up the path invisibly and grab the fleece, but in the end, I convinced her that something would go wrong. The sheep would smell her. Another guardian would appear. Something. And if that happened, I'd be too far away to help. Besides, our first job was to find Grover and whoever had come ashore in that lifeboat, assuming they had gotten past the sheep. I was too nervous to say what I was secretly hoping, that Tyson might still be alive. We moored the Queen Anne's Revenge on the back side of the island, where the cliffs rose straight up a good 200 feet. I figured the ship would be less likely to be seen there. The cliffs looked climbable, barely, but as difficult as the lava wall back at camp. At least it was free of sheep. I hoped that Polyphemus did not also keep carnivorous mountain goats. We rowed a lifeboat to the edge of the rocks and made our way up, very slowly. Annabeth went first because she was the better climber. We only came close to dying six or seven times, which I thought was pretty good. Once I lost my grip and found myself dangling by one hand from a ledge 50 feet above the rocky surf, but I found another handhold and kept climbing. A minute later, Annabeth hit a slippery patch of moss and her foot slipped. Fortunately, she found something else to put it against. Unfortunately, that something was my face. Sorry, she murmured. It's okay, I grunted, though I never really wanted to know what Annabeth's sneaker tasted like. Finally, when my fingers felt like molten lead and my arm muscles were shaken from exhaustion, we hauled ourselves over the top of the cliff and collapsed. Ugh, I said. Ow, moaned Annabeth. Rawr, bellowed another voice. If I hadn't been so tired, I would have leaped 200 feet. I whirled around, but couldn't see who had spoken. Annabeth clamped her hand over my mouth. She pointed. The ledge we were sitting on was narrower than I realized. It dropped off to the opposite side, and that's where the voice was coming from, right below us. You're a feisty one, the deep voice bellowed. Challenge me, Clarissa's voice, no doubt about it. Give me back my sword and I'll fight you. The monster roared with laughter. Annabeth and I crept to the edge. We were right above the entrance to the Cyclops' cave. Below us stood Polyphemus and Grover, still in his wedding dress. Clarice was tied up, hanging upside down over a pot of boiling water. I was half hoping to see Tyson down there too. Even if he had been in danger, at least I would have known he was alive. But there was no sign of him. Hmm, Polyphemus pondered. Eat loudmouth girl now, or wait for wedding feast. What does my bride think? He turned to Grover, who backed up and almost tripped over his completed bridal train. Oh, I, I 
I'm not hungry right now, dear. Perhaps... Did you say bride? Clarice demanded. Who, Grover? Next to me, Annabeth muttered. Shut up. Shut up. She has to shut up. Polyphemus glowered. What, Grover? The satyr, Clarice yelled. Oh, Grover yelped. The poor thing's his brain is boiling from that hot water. P put her down, dear. Polyphemus' eyelid narrowed over his baleful milky eye, as if he were trying to see Clarice more clearly. The Cyclops was an even more horrible sight than he had been in my dreams, partly because his rancid smell was now up close and personal, partly because he was dressed in his wedding outfit, a crude kilt and shoulder wrap stitched together from baby blue tuxedos as if he had skinned an entire wedding party. What satyr? asked Polyphemus. Satyrs are good eating. You bring me a satyr? No, you big idiot, bellowed Clarice. That satyr, Grover, the one in the wedding dress. I wanted to wring Clarice's neck, but it was too late. All I could do was watch as Polyphemus turned and ripped off Groder's wedding veil, revealing his curly hair, his scruffy adolescent beard, his tiny horns. Polyphemus breathed heavily, trying to contain his anger. I don't see very well, he growled. Not since many years ago when the other hero stabbed me in the eye. But you're no Lady Cyclops! The Cyclops grabbed Grover's dress and tore it away. Underneath, the old Grover reappeared in his jeans and t-shirt. He yelped and ducked as the monster swiped over his head. No! Grover pleaded. Don't eat me raw! I, I have a good recipe! I reached for my sword, but Annabeth hissed. Wait! Polyphemus was hesitating, a boulder in his hand, ready to smash his would-be bride. Recipe? He asked Grover. Oh, yes. You don't want to eat me raw. You'll get E. coli and botulism and all sorts of horrible things. I'll taste much better grilled over a fi slow fire with mango chutney. You could go get some mangoes right now down there in the woods. I'll just wait here. The monster pondered this. My heart hammered against my ribs. I figured I'd die if I charged, but I couldn't let the monster kill Grover. Grilled satyr with mango chutney, Polyphemus mused. He looked back at Clarice, still hanging over the pot of boiling water. You a satyr too? No, you overgrown pile of dung! She yelled. I'm a girl, the daughter of Ares! Now untie me so I can rip your arms off! Rip my arms off, Polyphemus repeated. And stuff them down your throat! You got spunk. Let me down! Polyphemus snatched up Grover as if he were a wayward puppy. Have to graze sheep now. Wedding postponed until tonight. Then we'll eat Seder for the main course. But you're still getting married? Grover sounded hurt. Who's the bride? Polyphemus looked toward the boiling pot. Clarice made a strangled sound. Oh, no. You can't be serious. I'm not. Before Annabeth and I could do anything, Polyphemus plucked her off the rope like she was a ripe apple and tossed her and Grover deep into the cave. Make yourself comfortable. I come back at sundown for big event. Then the Cyclops whistled, and a mixture of flock of goats and sheep, smaller than the man-eaters, flooded out of the cave and passed their master. As they went to pasture, Polyphemus patted some on the back and called them by name. Beltbuster, Tamamini, Lockhart, etc. When the last sheep had waddled out, Polyphemus rolled a boulder in front of the doorway as easily as I could close a refrigerator door, shutting off the sound of Clarice and Grover screaming inside. Mangoes, mangoes, Polyphemus grumbled to himself. What are mangoes? He strolled off down the mountain in his baby blue groomsy outfit, leaving us alone with a pot of boiling water and a six-ton boulder. We tried for what seemed like hours, but it was no good. The boulder wouldn't move. We yelled into the cracks, tapped on the rock, did everything we could think of to get a signal from Grover, but if he heard us, he, we couldn't tell. Even if by some miracle we managed to kill Polyphemus, it wouldn't do us any good. Clarice and Grover would die inside that sealed cave. The only way to move the rock is to have the Cyclops do it. In total frustration, I stabbed Riptide against the boulder. Sparks flew, but nothing else happened. A large rock is not the kind of enemy you can fight with a magic sword. Annabeth and I sat on the ridge in despair and watched the distant baby blue shape of the Cyclops as he moved among his flocks. He had wisely divided his regular animals from his man-eating sheep, putting each group on either side of the huge crevice that divided the island. 
The only way across was the rope bridge, and the planks were much too far apart for sheep hooves. I, we watched as Polyphemus visited his carnivorous flock on the far side. Unfortunately, they didn't eat him. In fact, they didn't seem to bother with him at all. He fed them chunks of mystery meat from a great whisker basket, which only reinforced the feelings I had been having since Circe turned me into a guinea pig. Then maybe it was time I joined Grover and became a vegetarian. Trickery, Annabeth decided. We can't beat him by force, so we'll have to use trickery. Okay, what trick? I haven't figured that part out yet. Great. Polyphemus will have to move the rock to let the sheep inside. At sunset, I said, which is when he'll marry Clarice and have Grover for dinner. I'm not sure which is grosser. I could get inside, she said, invisibly. What about me? The sheep, Annabeth mused. She gave me one of those sly looks that always made me feel wary. How much do you like sheep? Just don't let go, Annabeth said, standing invisibly somewhere off to my right. That was easy for her to say. She wasn't hanging upside down from the belly of a sheep. Now, I'll admit it wasn't as hard as I thought. I'd crawled under her car before to change my mom's oil, and this wasn't too different. The sheep didn't even care. Even the Cyclops' smallest sheep was big enough to support my weight, and they had thick wool. I just twirled the stuff into handles for my hands, hooked my feet against the sheep's thigh bones, and presto, I felt like a baby wallaby, riding around against the sheep's chest, trying to keep the wool out of my mouth and nose. In case you're wondering, the underside of a sheep doesn't smell that great. Imagine a winter sweater that had been dragged through the mud and left in the laundry hamper for a week. Something like that. The sun was going down. No sooner was I in position that the Cyclops roared. Oi! Goaties! Sheepies! The flock dutifully began trudging back up the slopes toward the cave. This is it! Annabeth whispered. I'll be close by, don't worry! I made a silent promise to the gods that if we survived this, I'd tell Annabeth she was a genius. The frightening thing was, I knew the gods would hold me to it. My sheep taxi started plodding up the hill. After a hundred yards, my hands and feet started to hurt from holding on. I gripped the sheep's wool more tightly and the animal made a grumbling sound. I didn't blame it. I wouldn't want anybody rock climbing in my hair either. But if I didn't hold on, I was sure to fall off right here in front of the monster. Asenfeffer, the cyclops said, patting one of the sheep in front of me. Einstein, widget. Hey there, widget. Polyphemus patted my sheep and nearly locked me to the ground. Putting on some extra mutton there. Uh-oh, I thought. Here it comes. But Polyphemus just laughed and swatted the sheep's rear end, propelling us forward. Go on, fatty. Soon Polyphemus will eat you for breakfast. And just like that, I was in the cave. I could see the last of the sheep coming inside. If Annabeth didn't pull off her distraction soon... The Cyclops was about to roll the stone back into place. Went from somewhere outside, Annabeth shouted, Hello, ugly! Polyphemus stiffened. Who said that? Nobody! Annabeth yelled. That got exactly the reaction she had been hoping for. The monster's face turned red with rage. Nobody! Polyphemus yelled back. I remember you! You're too stupid to remember anybody! Annabeth taunted. Much less nobody! I hoped to the god she was already moving when she said that, because Polyphemus bellowed furiously, grabbed the nearest boulder, which happened to be his front door, and threw it toward the sound of Annabeth's voice. I heard the rock smash into a thousand fragments. For a terrible moment, there was silence. Then Annabeth shouted, You haven't learned to throw any better either! Polyphemus howled, Come here! Let me kill you, nobody! You can't kill nobody, you stupid oaf! She taunted. Come and find me! Polyphemus barreled down the hill toward her voice. Now, the nobody thing wouldn't have made sense to anybody, but Annabeth had explained to me that it was the name Odysseus had used to trick Polyphemus centuries ago, right before he poked the Cyclops' eye out with a large hot stick. Annabeth had figured Polyphemus would still have a grudge about that name, and she was right. In his frenzy to find his old enemy, he forgot about resealing the cave entrance. Apparently, he didn't even stop to consider that Annabeth's voice was female, whereas the first nobody had been male. On the other hand, he'd want to marry Grover, so he couldn't have been all that bright about the whole male-female thing. I just hoped Annabeth could stay alive and keep di distracting him long enough for me to find Grover and Clarice. I dropped off my ride, patted Widget on the head, and apologized. I searched the main room, but there was no sign of Grover or Clarice. I pushed through the crowd of sheep and goats toward the back of the cave. Even though I had dreamed about this place, I had a hard time finding my way through the maze. 
I ran down corridors littered with bones, past rooms full of sheep shit skin rugs and life-size cement sheep that I recognized as the work of Medusa. There were collections of sheep t-shirts, large tubs of linolen cream, and woolly coats, socks, and hats with ram's horns. Finally, I found the spinning room, where Grover was huddled in the corner, trying to cut Clarissa's bonds with a pair of safety scissors. It's now good, Clarice said. This robe's like iron. Just a few more minutes. Grover, you've been working at it for hours. Then they saw me. Percy, Clarice said. You're supposed to be blown up. Good to see you too. Now hold still while I... Percy, Grover bleated and tackled me with a goat hug. You heard me, you came. Yeah, buddy, of course I came. Where's Annabeth? Outside, but there's no time to talk. Clarice, hold still. I uncapped Riptide and sliced off her ropes. She stood stiffly, rubbing her wrists. She glared at me for a moment, then looked at the ground and mumbled, Thanks. You're welcome, I said. Now, was anybody else on board your lifeboat? Clarice looked surprised. No, just me. Everyone else aboard the Birmingham... Well, I didn't even see you guys made it out. I looked down, trying not to believe that my last hope of seeing Tyson alive had just been crushed. Okay, come on then, we have to help. An explosion echoed through the cave, followed by a scream that told me we might be too late. It was Annabeth crying out in fear. 